Thank you all so much for being here today. I'm Jim Benikoff. I'm Vice Provost for Faculty Affairs here at Baylor. Uh, and it's really a privilege to welcome all of you today and to introduce our speaker. Uh, for some of you, I'm sure he needs no introduction. <laughs> the Cornelia Marshall Smith Professor of the Year Award is the premier faculty honor here at Baylor. It was inaugurated 19 years ago by the Office of the Provost. Nominations for this award are uh, requested from all faculty, students, and alumni, and the recipient of the award is chosen from among the nominees by a committee of four faculty members and, and the Vice Provost for Faculty Affairs. Uh, and for this year's award, those faculty members were Cassie Burleson, Sandy Cooper, Mark Taylor, who is present with us in the audience, uh, seeing what he has wrought, uh, and uh, a Andrea Turpin. Uh, and so I wanted to express my gratitude to each one of those people uh, for their gracious and painstaking work. Um, I also want to ask all of you, actually, to consider, if you would, nominating a candidate. The deadline for the next round of candidacies would be November, it's around November 15th, uh, and we'll send out a call for nominations early in the fall semester, uh, but the process totally depends on nominations. The, the committee doesn't go around and say, oh, let's, let's look at this person and that person or whatever. It's, it totally depends on nominations so that we can get uh, worthy candidates and, and winners of the award, such as uh, Ken here. Uh, so the Smith Award is presented each spring at the annual University Honors Convocation in April, and so there will be an announcement uh, in a couple weeks of the next uh, winner. On the back of your program, you have a list of previous recipients of the award, uh, which is an august group of people indeed. We have, in fact, Alden Smith here is, is one of those. So. Um, each recipient receives a plaque, and his or her name is also added to a large plaque in the office of the provost. Uh, the award winner also receives a cash award of $20,000, minus what the IRS takes. <laughs> and finally, the honoree presents a lecture on an academic subject of his or her choice uh, in the following academic year, and we have the pleasure today of gathering uh, to hear that presentation. There's some information on your program about Cornelia Marshall Smith, after whom the award is named. Uh, she was a longtime member of the Baylor community. She was an alumna, a professor, chair of Baylor's biology department. Uh, she was also, this may surprise you, a Robert Browning scholar. Won't surprise you since you know Baylor has that connection, but it might surprise you since she was a biology uh, professor. Uh, she wrote a series of books about uh, Browning and different uh, biblical kinds of themes and so forth. Uh, so um, um, as many of us still remember, she participated actively in all facets of university life, even after her retirement and almost until her death at the age of 101 years. So could we all be so fortunate? Uh, serving on the selection committee for an award like this is always an exercise in humility because while performing this task, one is constantly confronted with an overwhelming array of contributions that the nominees for the award have made to the university. Uh, the back of your program also pro provides a description of the award, <laughs> and as it states, these contributions fall in the three traditional realms that apply to the work of any faculty member, uh, highly effective teaching, outstanding research and or creative activity, and exemplary service. Various candidates excel to different degrees in these realms. Uh, some are particularly renowned for their teaching. Some have tirelessly served Baylor uh, and the local and wider community in various ways. Some have made extensive and powerful contributions to uh, research conversations in the United States and around the globe. Dr. Van Troren has uh, actually contributed, ext contributed extensively in all these realms. He's, his research has yielded over 130 articles, book chapters, and conference papers. Uh, he's been awarded hundreds of thousands of dollars in external grant funding for research within his discipline. He's also been called upon frequently to review submissions to a variety of journals and to chair sessions at conferences. Uh, in 2021, he was elected to be an associate fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics and a fellow in the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. 
Dr. Van Troren's work within his discipline has also included an extensive amount of service. In the last six years, he's won three different awards for outstanding service. But he's also consistently served in his local church in leadership and on the worship team and in the wider Waco community, including helping to nurture student interest in studies related to his own uh, area of expertise. And I've actually had the privilege of standing with him uh, with a guitar in hand leading elementary school kids in singing, uh, what, 25, 30 years ago? I don't know what happened, but anyway. So that's a little tidbit for you. Uh, did not specifically contribute to his selection for the award. <laughs> Uh, as extensive and excellent as Dr. Van Troren's research and service activities have been, it appears to me, though, as though his greatest contribution and perhaps his greatest passion may well be found in his teaching. The selection committee received dozens of letters from current or former university students testifying to the impact that he had made on their lives. Beyond that, he's been invited to teach in a variety of non-university settings, including cutting-edge industry. In addition to having won Baylor's Award for Outstanding Teaching by a non-tenured faculty member, and then Baylor's Award for Outstanding Teaching by a tenured faculty member, uh, it usually comes in that order, uh, <laughs> just seeing if you're following here, uh, he's, um, He's won a national award for teaching within his discipline. He was a pioneer at Baylor in sponsoring undergraduate research, which is something that we've really been very interested in cultivating and developing here over the last 10, 15 years. Um, he's received hundreds of thousands of dollars beyond what I mentioned earlier in regard to his own research uh, in federal and private funding to enhance students' abilities to learn effectively about their discipline and its relationship to societal needs. Uh, unsurprisingly, in view of all this, Dr. Venturin has regularly been called upon to lead his faculty colleagues in programs that can help them to learn how to improve their own teaching. As I did last spring when I initially announced Dr. Venturin's selection for this award, I'll give the last word here to just a few of the students who wrote about him. Most of those students are now active in their field, uh, either in academia or in industry. Their letters are riddled with superlatives, gratitude, and personal stories about incidents in which Dr. Van Furen provided significant enlightenment or encouragement. A consistent theme was simply the extraordinary amount of time uh, and energy that he commits to his students. In many cases, the students describe the evolution of their relationships with him in great detail. We had letters pages long. But here are just three brief quotations. One, the most impressive thing about Dr. Van Furen is not his extraordinary technical acumen. It is the way that he takes a personal interest in the lives of each and every one of his students. A second student said, above all, my biggest takeaway from Dr. Van Furen was how I could apply his Christian outlook on engineering. I learned that an engineer's purpose is to learn of God's creation and design solutions to serve his children. Finally, a third uh, writer says, with a wide open door, lectures, assignments, and laboratories, Dr. Van Furen shaped me and hundreds before and since into deserving graduates ready for life after Baylor and for that Dr. Van Furen deserves to win the Cornelia Marshall Smith Professor of the Year Award, and the committee certainly agreed. Obviously, as I said, we all, the other, many other supporters of his nomination, as well as the selection committee, agreed with this. And so it's my great pleasure now to introduce the 19th recipient of the Cornelia Marshall Smith Professor of the Year Award from the Department of Mechanical Engineering in the Baylor School of Engineering and Computer Science, Dr. Ken Van Furen.
Thank you. I noticed a few of my students here, they may be asking for extra credit, I think, <laughs> is what that might be. But no, I, I'm honored and humbled to be a recipient of this award. I, I look at the names on the program, and they're some of my heroes. I've been here long enough to know most of them, and, and I'm just excited to be now thought of. Now, I've been teaching engineering ed in engineering education for about 30 years, or more than 30 years, and the, the, the reality is Getting an award is nice, but it's not why we do this. Why we do this. I'm going to hopefully, in the next few minutes this afternoon, give you some insight into who I am, how God brought me to Baylor, because I do believe that, and, and what it's like for me to teach here at Baylor. So that's what I hope to do. Now, there is a, 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 this, this a presentation. I have to do the presentation, right? I mean, that's part of the winning the award. But you know, I'm an engineer. And, and, and I wish I had a little more guidance and a little more data to help me. Give me a topic, and I can do a PowerPoint slideshow all day long, right? So, so I'm sitting here. About 100 different topics have come through my mind over the last year. That's why it took so long to get to this point. And, and I, I had research on them, and I probably wrote and rewrote this presentation about uh, two dozen times to get it here. Uh, and so you think about that. This is an ill-defined problem, right, students? Don't we ask you to do that all the time? So I should be able to do this, right? I got this, right? So I, so I have chosen a few topics to go over this afternoon, and I think, I hope you enjoy what that is. So, and I want to thank Jim and Debbie for being patient to get to this point. So thank you very much. So with that, let's go look at the topics that I've chosen to go over this afternoon. And the first thing, uh, I know there's lots of engineers in the room, but there's some people who maybe haven't hung around engineers very much. So you don't know what it is, what we do. And I'm hoping to change that this afternoon. I'm going to talk about my journey to Baylor. Every one of us has a story, because I know I've talked with many of you that brought you to Baylor. God brought you to Baylor. And we don't talk about that enough. So I'm going to show you my pathway. And I'm old, so it took me a long time to get here. So, so I'm going to show you my pathway to Baylor. And then I got here in 1998. Some of you weren't even born in 1998, right? So, so I want to talk about the difference between then and now. And there's quite a difference between then and now. And sprinkled throughout the presentation are some of the things that I've learned along the way. And maybe those are good things for you to learn as well. Uh, and, and you won't have to suffer some of the things that I went through in my life. But I'm going to finish with something that I've really been convicted about. And the reason, I, one of the reasons I think it took me so long to get this presentation out is because I got to read this article. And I'll show you the article. And it's, it's really what I'm titling, The Challenge of Being Baylor. The Challenge of Being Baylor what we have ahead of us. So, so how do people see engineers? There's stereotypes out there, isn't there? And people see engineers just like that. So look at that. Look at this. White shirt, bow tie, pocket protectors. Look at those glasses. Aren't they wonderful? And look at the lack of diversity in NASA. I do think there's a woman somewhere back here, but just one. These are the people who took us to the moon, right? They knew what they were doing, but that's the stereotype. And even today, people still think about that stereotype. It hasn't changed, right? You still see white shirts, bow ties, and pocket protectors, right? Pocket protectors. Now, we've, we've moved on a little bit. Here's Dilbert, right? Who hasn't read a Dilbert cartoon? And, and we, we see the mind of the engineer, not, just not the picture with Dilbert. And I think that's pretty good. So, but more recently, how many people have seen this TV show? Yeah, OK. How many have laughed at that TV show? Yeah, even me. I've laughed at some of the things there. Which person in that picture is the engineer? Which one? Howard. Howard. How was he treated by his friends, the scientists? How was he treated? Yeah. They didn't like him. They, they talked down to him. I mean, they didn't treat him very nice at all. And this is kind of what the, what the stereotype goes through, right? So, so poor Howard, he kind of was, took the brunt of it for us engineers in the story. So, so that's interesting. Uh, but what's next? The reality is that engineers are special. And all you engineers in the room, you need to know that. You are special. And why are you special? Because God gave you the knack. <laughs> gave you the knack. OK. Some of you may not have seen this before, but you need to. This is the knack. 
I've been sitting here for nearly a minute without entertainment. Change the battery in the remote. The one on the left. The one on the left? Well, that's just spooky. Not really. I have the knack. The knack? For technology. My mom says I always have. I'm worried about little Dilbert. He's not like other kids. What do you mean? Yesterday, I left him alone for a minute, <coughs> and he disassembled the TV, our clock, and the stereo. That's perfectly normal. Kids take things apart. Oh. The part that worries me is he used the components to build a ham radio set. Oh, dear. <laughs> is that bad? Normally, I'd want to run an EEG on it, but the machine isn't working. It's worse than I feared. What is it? I'm afraid your son has the Mac. The Mac? The Mac. It's a rare condition characterized by an extreme intuition about all things mechanical and electrical and other social entities. So that's the knack, right? And that's on the inside. There's a lot of things engineers keep on. We're usually pretty quiet. We don't like the spotlight. We like to do our job, get it done, and, and, and we're happy with that. We don't need a lot of uh, accolades that go with all these things because we love just getting the job done and doing our thing, right? So, so deep down inside, though, how do engineers see themselves? We see ourselves as superheroes, right? <laughs> because we do these kinds of things. We do these kinds of things to help people. So yeah, we're superheroes, and that's really pretty good. So. But you know, outside, we kind of look like everybody else. We really don't look that much different. In God's eyes, we are all the same. So, so if I have a picture of some students, there could very well be an engineer in that picture, right? Because they look like everybody else, right? How about that picture? That's actually when we beat A&M back in 2004, and they tore the goalpost down and carried it all the way back from Floyd Casey Stadium. I was in that. I was in that crowd. I was there. So, so there's at least one engineer in that picture, me. So, uh, but here's a picture of some real live mechanical engineers. This was our ASME group, and we were going to go to a conference. Now, great. They look just like everybody else, but there's something wrong with that picture. And I, I put it up there, and it, I couldn't dawn on me until just a couple of days ago what's wrong with that picture. There are no holes in the jeans. <laughs> no holes in the jeans. Maybe that's how you tell an engineer they don't put holes in their jeans. I don't know. But anyway, those are some great people uh, that we've had. Uh, and Yasmin, I think, is online. So hi, Yasmin. So, so what's engineering? Well, I ask my students this every year, and we start the class, and I say, what's engineering? If you're seniors, you ought to know what engineering is, right? And many of my students think engineering is this, application of science and math to solve problems. Do we do that, engineers? Yeah, we do that. But that's not the whole definition. Something's missing with that. And what's missing is what we see on the next slide. What do we do? We produce things, but we improve people's quality of life. Prove people's quality of life. We serve humankind's needs and wants. And let me read this. The role of an engineer is to tackle some of the world's biggest problems or challenges. I would like to call them challenges. Helping to save lives and create fantastic new technologies, advancement, technological advancements that can improve the way we live. After reading that, who doesn't want to be an engineer? Right? That's so exciting. And that's what we have to look forward to. Now, what are some things in the last century that engineers have been involved with? And these are just a few, right? How about electricity? If we didn't have electricity, we'd be sitting in the dark right now, right? No lights, no electricity. How about cars? We like our cars. We like doing that. How about airplanes? We like, and helicopters, sorry. We like helicopters too. But how about airplanes? Yeah, some really cool airplanes. How about radio, television, 
computers, telephone. And if you live in the South, you are so glad God invented air conditioning and refrigeration. I don't know how people lived in the South before that. But these are all things that engineers have had a part in in helping improve our lives. And what's in the future? This is the National Academy of Engineering. National Academy of Engineering says all of these things are challenges that we have for the future. Now, you can sleep well at night knowing that engineers will be involved with all of those topics. All of those topics. So did I always want to be an engineer? No, I wanted to be a pilot. That's what I wanted to do. And if I wanted to be a pilot, where's the best place to go in the United States to get an education to be a pilot? Air Force Academy. What a great place. Now, I put some things down there. My dad was a commercial pilot. He, he was a commercial pilot, but he never went to college. You need to go to college now to be a pilot. But back then, he didn't have to. So that kind of got me started thinking about airplanes. My grandparents were immigrants. They came through Ellis Island from Holland, which is really kind of interesting when you think about that. Uh, and, and he was a laundry truck driver, my grandfather. Uh, but I'm a first gen. I'm the first person in my family to go through college, first generation to go through college. So I know what some people in, in, that are coming in right now are going through, because my parents didn't have a clue what college was all about. My parents didn't have a clue what the military was all about. But I learned pretty quickly about all that. So at the academy, that's me, 1973, I studied aeronautical engineering, and not just planes, I fell in love with gas turbines and rocket <laughs> engines, right? And in rocket engines, those things are cool. So that's me as a freshman. That's me as a senior. Don't I look the same? <laughs> exactly the same, thank you. You said thank you, and that's good. But, but yeah, I, I, I loved what I did there. I had a great time doing that, and I still wanted to be a pilot. But the most important thing happened to me while I was there. I met this young lady. Oh. And it was truly a miracle because remember, when I went to that school, it was an all boys school. <laughs> Just to meet a woman was pretty much a miracle. <laughs> and not let alone the one that you married. That was, pretty, that was pretty cool. And here we are, 45 years of marriage later. So thank you. Thank you. So here's my first takeaway, education. It's the key to your future. That's why we're in this business. It's the key to the future. Never turn down education when you're offered, especially if it's free, right? Now, for my parents, the Air Force Academy was free, wasn't it? They didn't have to pay for that. The taxpayers, yeah, they paid some. Cost me five years of my life. I had a commitment when I graduated, but it was worth it because I wanted to go there and I wanted to do what I was doing, right? So I learned how to be a lifelong learning and I tell everybody in this room, you need to learn how to learn if you don't know that already. Uh, I love going to workshops and short courses and conferences. I love reading on the subject. I teach aeronautical courses mostly now. I read all those magazines and more just to stay up on what's going on. I love learning. That's why I'm in a pretty good place. God knew that. So next up was going to be pilot training, but I got more free education. I got a Guggenheim Fellowship to go study at Princeton University. I think you might have heard of that one, right? Princeton University happened to be 20 minutes from where I grew up. I thought, this is great. I get to go home. Only problem is I had to pay state income tax when I went there, so that wasn't very good. But Princeton University, I studied hydrocarbon combustion. That was the closest thing they had to gas turbines there. And I had to learn organic chemistry, engineers. Do you ever think that you would have to learn organic? Ooh, yeah, that's just for pre-med people, right? But here I had to learn, because I had to balance equations and do all those things again. So that was good. And oh, by the way, the Air Force said, well, you've got a year to finish your master's degree. And so, OK, I didn't know any different, right? Eight courses and a thesis? Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> and that was before the internet with, uh, with, with uh, Word and all of these internet packages. We typed it on a typewriter. I paid somebody a dollar a page to type my thesis. That was good money back then, let me tell you. So, so we got it done. I actually had two medical operations during graduate school, too. I didn't want to have two medical operations. But they said, your nasal passageway is too small, and we need to make it bigger so you could be a pilot. Who knew pilots had to have a certain nasal passageway? I didn't know. <laughs> but it cost me two operations to get it where it was, and I finally got that all finished. And oh, by the way, how hard can Princeton be? 
I just finished the Air Force Academy, so how hard can Princeton be? So we got married that year. <laughs> Tell you what a special woman this is, right? So we got married that year. Well, we made it through the year and got, got it all done. And my next stop was more free education. I was going to go to undergraduate pilot training, right? It was a year-long training to go to the military training. It's the best flight training in the world, the military training. And don't I look good? <laughs> yeah, it looks pretty good. No, it's not me. But that's what we all thought. Let's go strap on the jet and go fly. Right? That's what we wanted to do. And everybody at pilot training gets hero pictures. So I do have some hero pictures, which I'll share with you. There I am, getting ready to go strap on the jet and go fly. Yeah. Wonderful. What a, what a wonderful year it was. And it led me to a career in the military flying, just like Dick Campbell, right? So we're up there flying and, and gave me the passion that I had for flying. I always wanted to fly and I finally got to do it. What a great thing that was. So, so my goal was to be the best pilot because that's what God would want me to do, to be the best pilot that I could possibly be. So, so we did. That's, those are the planes I flew. The white ones that you see are trainers, right? And I did train people how to fly. I could do that. The big ones are what I did operationally. That's a KC-135. It's a Boeing 707 that could refuel other planes. See this pipe back here? We would stick it into a plane that came up behind us, and we would pass gas. <laughs> Good. That's a refueling joke, by the way. It's one of the few we had. We would pass gas, right? So... Yeah. So, so that's what we did. This was a KC-10. It was a DC-10, also had a boom and could be refueled and refuel other planes. So this is what I did. I could be up here. I could be here. I could do either one of those things. And I had a ball doing that, flying all over the world, falling all over the world and doing that. Now, one of the things we used to do was what we call air show takeoffs. Now, I brought a, a visual aid. I don't know if you're supposed to do that in this one, but I'm a teacher, right? So this helps. So, so here's an airplane, KC-10, 590,000 pounds fully loaded. We got to do something at the air show because they got the Thunderbirds, right, with afterburners and everything. So let's show the air show takeoff. We put about 30,000 pounds of gas on the plane when it would hold 350,000 pounds. So we're really light. We roll it on the runway, we push the throttles forward and let the plane accelerate until we almost reach what's called tire placard speed. Tire placard speed is the speed, if I go faster than that, the tire disintegrates. So that was about 170 knots. So we got the 170 knots, the, the, the flight engineer says rotate, the copilot says rotate, and we pull the plane off the ground 45 degrees nose high. Now I guarantee if American Airlines did that to you, you would go, oh, we're all gonna die, right? <laughs> But we're professionals. Don't worry about it. We're professionals. And so we would have this plane climbing at 45 degrees nose high. The airspeed indicator is doing this kind of thing, and the flight engineer is glued to it. Right before we got to the stall speed, you people who've taken aero know this, what this is. Right before the stall speed, we would take the airplane and we'd do this. We'd roll at 90 degrees, let the nose drop to the horizon, and then dish it out. And you'd be about 2,000 feet above the ground within the confines of the runway. And let me tell you, that's impressive when you see a big airplane that close to the ground doing those kinds of things. So, yeah, we had fun doing those kinds of things. Uh, except one time the general saw us do that at an air show. He goes, are they supposed to do that? <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, that's what we do. So, so anyway, so we did that. We also, I got to fly all over the world. And this was one of my first deployments in the KC-10. Oh, it was so cool. But they tell you, they call you up and they say, can't tell you where you're going, can't tell you when you're coming home, but pack your bags. That was one of these trips. And so Renee's home all by herself. She didn't know where I was. She didn't know what I was doing. And we ended up in that land. We weren't supposed to talk about it, but we were in that land. Eventually they said, you guys can send a postcard home if you want. And we did. We said, isn't this a great view from, from where we are? Didn't say who we were or where we were, but we said, hey, isn't this a great view? And that way she knew I was in Egypt. What a great time flying all over the world, seeing these kinds of things. I got to see the, the pyramids. I got to see uh, the, the King Tut mask. I got to see all this stuff, which was wonderful. And I really loved doing that. But then God brought this little girl into our life. Oh, that's my little Sherry. And when she was nine months old, I'd been out of the country five months of her life. 
That was hard. Because remember, back then, we didn't have the Internet. We didn't have social media. We didn't have any of that. We wrote letters and put a stamp on it and sent it home. It took about three weeks to get there. So, so I, I said, God, I, I, the desire of my heart is to stay home and watch my little girl grow up. That's what I wanted to do. And I walked into my squadron commander, and I walked into the squadron commander and said, Sir, I love flying airplanes for you, but if I can't be home and watch my little girl grow up, I'm going to have to get out of the service. That's like the kiss of death for your career, to go in and tell your commander that. But it's what I had in my heart. And another miracle, two months later, I'm back here. I'm at the Air Force Academy teaching in the aeronautics department. Let me tell you, it's so much nicer giving tests rather than taking them. <laughs> so we learned a lot about that. But I had a great time at the Air Force Academy. We spent a tour of duty there, which was five, four years, and a little more. And then they said, you got to go back to fly, Ken. You're going to say, I have to go back to fly. And I said, oh, if I have to, I will. I mean, it's not so bad to go fly, right? Flying's fun. But then the first Gulf War happened. And after the Gulf War, we did what we always do after a war. We drew down the number of airplanes we needed. We drew down the number of wings that were flying. And, and we said, OK, this is what we're going to do. So I called up Strategic Air Command headquarters. And I, I called him up, the guy who was handling my career. And I hear the voice, and I go, is this Dave Jensen? Out of all the people in the Air Force, is this Dave Jensen? And he goes, yeah, is this Ken? It was my navigator from when I flew KC-135s. And he goes, oh, it's good to talk to you. We don't need you to fly anymore. Oh, wonderful. And he goes, the next question, what do you want to do? Well, the Air Force Academy was going to send me for a PhD. I'd love to go get a PhD. And he goes, sounds good to me. And the very next question is, where do you want to go? And I said, well, the Air Force Academy was going to send me to Oxford University. I'd really love to go there. And that's where we went. Talk about miracles. All, when you look back on your life and you see these things, you just go, thank you, God. Thank you, God. So we went to Oxford. Now, 1845 seems pretty old, doesn't it, for Baylor? We talk about that all the time. Oldest in Texas, you know, before it was even a state. This is my college at Oxford. It's Merton College. I have to do this. It's Merton College, founded in 1264. 1264. When we've always done it that way, it was for centuries they've always done it that way. What a great thing. The, the dining facility looked just like Harry Potter. I mean, it was just like that with trestle tables. All. It was so cool to be there and so cool to study. I had a project with Rolls-Royce. I was looking at impingement cooling of, of turbine blades. Three years to work on the same problem. People say you're nuts, but I loved doing it. It was great. In fact, I get close to the end of my time there, and, and I get this, Ken, you got a call on line one. You may not know what that is, but that was back when we had separate phone lines, one, two, three, four, right? Not a cell phone stuff, you know? And so, so I pick it up and they go, hi, this is Rolls Royce. Can you tell us what you'd recommend for the next target plate to impingement plate spacing in our new turbine blades that we're making? And I go, they're asking me. I must know something, right? So I went and told them my research showed the optimum spacing was this and that. And I just, this was so cool to be able to do those kinds of things. I had a great time. So after my PhD, we were back teaching again at the Air Force Academy for another four years. And it was really that ignited my passion now because I could see the path forward. I knew I could go teach and I loved doing it. So it came time to leave the Air Force. Now what do I do? I love teaching there. I could fly for the airlines. I have an airline transport pilot rating. I could go work for Pratt & Whitney or GE or any of these engine companies because I knew people there. I could go work for them or I could teach. And I ended up going to Baylor on my very first interview ever in my entire life. In fact, I was in this exact same room giving a presentation. Talk about deja vu, right? Exact same room giving a presentation. And sure enough, Dean Bargainer back then gave me an offer of a job. Now, I love Baylor. I thought it was a great place, but I didn't know any different, right? And so I said to Dean Bargainer, I said, I'd really like to go interview at a couple more schools. Who tells, you, who tells that to the person who was offering you a job? And, and he goes, Ken, the job's yours when you want it. 
I didn't know how rare that was. I went to a couple other schools, but my heart was always being pulled back to Baylor, back to Baylor. I love the Christian mission. I love being able to be who I was all the time in the classroom with students. I love that. I couldn't do that at the Air Force Academy. And so here we are, 24 years later, still teaching at Baylor. Uh, some people say, well, you haven't done very much, have you? But uh, yes, I have. And when you think about all the people's lives you touch while you're here, that's really, really exciting for me to think about those kinds of things. And I wanted to be the best professor that I could be. Just like that, God wants us to be the most excellent that we can according to our abilities. So, so what, how did I do that? Well, I did a lot of things. I worked with the Current Entrepreneurial Engineering Network, Academy for Teaching and Learning with Lenore Wright, Institute for Faith and Learning with uh, Darren Davis. All of these things are available on Baylor, and I just soaked it up. I thought this was wonderful to be a part of all these things. I learned from other people. I actually went to the professional societies, as uh, Dr. Benninghoff talked about, and, and I went through and I, I ran the division for uh, mechanical engineers in ASCE, Engineering Society for Engineering Education, 850 members in that division. I actually was on the board of directors. I actually ran for president of that organization. So, so I got involved on those levels. Uh, I was the education committee chair for the International Gas Turbine Institute. All of those were good, building relationships, learning what others are doing, and publishing papers. If you ask Renee, it's just say, all you did in the last 24 years was write papers. That's what she would probably say. But uh, it's important that we get out what we learn, right? So, so here we are, 1998. Look at the statistics. About 11,000 students, about 1,800 grad students, 460 in ECS. And we only had two departments, engineering and computer science. Mike's shaking his head. I remember that. Five electricals, five mechanical professors. That was it. We graduated about 20 people a year. Let that sink in. And we didn't have any graduate programs. But look where we are today, 2022. A lot more undergraduates, a whole lot more graduate students. Our enrollment in the School of ECS is about double, more than double what it was. And you start to look at the three departments, and mechanical alone has 24 faculty. And we graduate in mechanical alone about 100 a year on average. That's amazing when you think about the growth in that time period. So why come to Baylor? Well, in the fall faculty meeting, the provost had these reasons why students come to Baylor. Strong name, focus on research, academic reputation, rigorous academics, and of course, learning experience rooted in Christian faith. And that's all important. But in 1998, it wasn't quite like that. In fact, I told people, I'm going to come teach engineering at Baylor. I was pretty excited. And this is what I got. <laughs> Does Baylor have engineering? Do so you remember this, right? All the time, we'd go everywhere, and they'd go, does Baylor have engineering? We had, Nobody knew. So we've come a long way. People know Baylor now, uh, but they didn't back then. But the Christian mission was very, very strong, and that's what attracted most of us to this place. So Dr. Sloan, 2012 vision, 2002 to 2012. These are the things that we did. I'm not going to read them, but I looked at them, and I said, if we could do half of these things, God is really going to bless Baylor. I was excited to read those. And since then, we have the strategic vision, five-year goals, illuminate we're in now, giving us these high visions for what we're doing here at Baylor. And the reality is these are high goals, but if we seek God, Baylor will definitely be blessed. And Baylor has been blessed. And I couldn't make the font any smaller on this because there's more things to put up there. But what I'm pointing out is I got this from Baylor Proud. There's a whole lot of things that we're in the top on all these lists of things, best places to work, research, we're research tier one. All of these things are things that I think God has blessed us for because we have kept true to, to who we are and we're trying to keep that true. So that's good. Now, what makes it important is the importance of Christian worldview. Here's the Baylor University mission statement. And when you look at it, you see integrating academic excellence and Christian commitment in a caring university. That's a big thing. And when I look at the School of Engineering and Computer Science, it says professional practice and responsible leadership in a Christian worldview. It's in there. And then when we look at the mechanical engineering mission statement, uh, motivated by Christian ideals and a vocational calling to improve the quality of life worldwide. Who doesn't want to be an engineer? Who doesn't want to be a mechanical engineer at Baylor? Those are great things to think about. 
And when I first came here, we did a lot of thinking. We did a lot of talking. And we wrote a lot of papers. Look at some of these. Integrating faith in the academic environment. Integrating faith in the academic environment, uh, uh, best practices. And you can go through these, Christian worldview and engineering. And I wrote papers with Steve Eisenbarth and Ian Gravania and Cindy Fry and Bill Jordan, my colleagues. And we had some great dialogue. We don't do so much of that anymore. We just don't. And I miss it. I really miss it. We had a great time back then writing these papers and doing this. So it's all about worldview. That's the sum total of who you are at this point in your life. And it's the lens with which you look at the world. And a Christian worldview is very, very important. So Steve and I got together and we wrote this thing. Uh, as a Christian, I believe in the triune God and personal redemption through the cross of Jesus Christ. God created the universe of which I am a part. And these beliefs, coupled with the knowledge and skills developed through the engineering curriculum, motivate me to live the life God would have me live, engaged in the vocation of engineering to make a difference in the world according to his will. Those are good words to live by. And, and, and I think we need to go back and really think hard about what that means to us. So I, we look at the world around us and we're inspired. And I love this word biomimicry because we look at what's around us and we get inspired by God's creation to solve human design challenges. And they're difficult problems. Even Leonardo da Vinci re realized this way back when, right? Look at what he said. These are inspired by a model other than God's creation uh, is a mistress above all, are laboring in vain. So God's creation can provide a multitude of inspirations for us as engineers. And here's one of them. Look at this. <laughs> I bet you didn't even know that fish existed. I didn't know. But look at it. It's a box fish. I think it gets a bad rap, but it's pretty colorful. But it's pretty square, isn't it? It's a box fish. Well, the reality is it's got one of the lowest aerodynamic, hydrodynamic drags of any, any, any shape. And Mercedes built a car and put it in the wind tunnel. And it had a drag coefficient really low of about 0.19. Now, I'm not going to buy that car, but it was really cool to see. And the fact that that fish really was the model for that car, and it worked out so well. How about this? The barn owl. The barn owl feathers make it really, really quiet because if it's flying, it doesn't want to disturb dinner, right? It wants to sneak up on dinner down there. So it's really, it's the quietest bird flying. Why can't we use that technology and put it on things like propellers? And you'll see some serrations on here on these propellers. And people are doing those kinds of things. Still pretty hard. Now, this is what we've been doing. I'll give you a little aerodynamics lecture right now. Uh, here's, here's an airplane. Little Bernoulli's, for those, some of you know Bernoulli's. But if the velocity goes up, the pressure goes down. If the velocity goes down, the pressure goes up. And so an airplane flies because we create a pressure imbalance. High pressure on the bottom, lower pressure on the top creates a lifting force. So that's pretty good, right? That's how it works. And then if I get to the tip, though, the air's pretty lazy. And if I get to the tip, what happens, instead of going to the back and creating all that lift, it takes the easy way around and creates a vortex. And any times the air is not going in the direction you want it to go, that's bad. Drag. It uses energy that we, it's in a form we're, we're not, we don't like. And so a lot of times you'll see those little winglets out there to stop that vortex, right? Birds do it differently. Birds take that distribution and they twist the end to get zero lift at the tip of their wing, which gets rid of the vortex and makes it more efficient. And so we read this paper about this and I, we're going, hey, why can't we do that on a propeller? Because the Wright brothers had it right. A propeller is a rotating wing. If it works on the wing, let's do it on the tip of a propeller. So we did. On the left, you'll see our propeller. On the right, your right, my left, you'll see our propeller. And we've essentially gotten rid of most of the vortex, which generates a lot of the noise and makes it less efficient. Here is a standard propeller on the left. You can see the difference. That's amazing. And so we did some studies and we did some testing and we made propellers with no lift at the tip. And when I did that with like my colleague at the Air Force Academy, we found a stock propeller compared to our propeller was 12 decibels quieter. That doesn't mean anything to many of you, even mechanical engineers, but it's a logarithmic scale. So every six decibels is a 50% reduction in the sound. Let that sink in. So it's 50% and then another 50% of what's left. 
And I've got some sound bites to play for you so that you can, you can hear that. And of course, Trey's here. Trey's the one who started all this propeller stuff 2013 back then, right? Remember that. So Trey's here for that. So let me, let me do this. And I'll play these sound bites for you. That's the stock propeller taken at a certain distance with a microphone. And now we're going to play our propeller under the same conditions. And you tell me if you can tell the difference. Now, as an engineer, we're just excited to do things like that, right? Oh, that's cool. It's quieter. And I was talking to Bradley Norris in Lab to Market one day about this, about this cool propeller. And he goes, that's really exciting. We should do something with that. And so he helped us do something. Baylor patented the design. Lab to Market started the commercialization. And now we got a company, a Thule Aero. A Thule Aero. We applied for some grants from AFWorks. It's an Air Force uh, organization. And we got STTR phase two. That's three quarters of a million dollars to prove the concept. And we're about ready to go fly and flight test our propellers on a quadcopter in April. Who knew? Who knew I'd be doing this right now? I didn't know, but God knew, right? And this is kind of where I am today. So, so I'm going to tell you, change is going to happen. Be ready for it. Be ready for it, right? And I've got one more example here that some of you may, uh, may uh, know or recognize. When I went... <laughs> You're laughing, but you know what it is, right? When I went to school, I was issued one of those. Bamboo posts, that's the best you could get. It's a, it's a slide rule. And, and I love my slide rule, but I could never figure out where to put the decimal point. I just couldn't figure that out. I was lost, you know, doing all these calculations. And so the very next year, Hewlett Packard came out with the HP 45. Oh, this is so cool. I got a calculator I can buy. It added, subtracted, multiplied, divided, and did trigonometric functions. You could get one of those from your bank today, I think, if you went in and opened an account, right? <laughs> I, I think you could. But I paid $450 for that in 1974. Well worth it, let me tell you. I slept better at night knowing I knew where to put the decimal point, so that was good. So, and, and then just a few years later, I got one of these. I couldn't afford a real Apple, so I got a clone. <laughs> they had those back then. 64K of memory in the computer, two floppy disk drives. Ah, somebody, let me tell you. And I thought this was, this was great. Pardon? How big? Five and a quarter? Yeah, five and a quarter. Yeah, the big floppies. Now, I didn't go for those little, little disk things, you know. So. But today, Look at what I got today. I got a desktop, I got a laptop, I got a Surface Pro, and I got a cell phone that just won't quit. This is made by Caterpillar. I bet you didn't even know they made cell phones. It's indestructible, thank you. I need those kind of things. It has a FLIR infrared camera, it has a laser rangefinder, and it has an air quality meter built in. Ask me if I need all those things. But they're cool to have, right? And it's all in my cell phone. I got a watch now that's smarter than I am. Anybody have smart watches? Yeah. Tells me what to do. It tells me when to wake up. Oh, it tells me everything. So it's a smart watch. But the point is, change is going to happen and be ready for it, right? These are some interesting quotes, and you may not agree with the numbers, but the ideas behind it are great. 85% of the jobs in today's learners in 2030 haven't been invented yet. That's amazing when you think about it. And 65% of the children entering primary school will ultimately end up working in completely new job types that don't even exist yet. So you faculty, we got to train our students to be able to handle these kind of changes. Students, you need to be lifelong learners so you can actually adapt when the markets change and your skills need to change. You've got to be ready for that. And, and that's what this is telling us. This is a day where my life changed very much, very completely. This is the day my house burned down. I don't wish that on anybody. I was coming back from the Student Life Center. Uh, yes, I did go back and work out and do all that stuff way back when. Uh, but I come back from the Student Life, and Bob Doty, one of my colleagues, says, Ken, sit down. You need to go home. Your house is on fire. 
I jumped up and got in my car, and I'm driving home. And in the distance, I see the mushroom cloud of smoke. And the whole time I'm driving home, I know that's my house. I know my house is burning. But it was so cool because all my pastors were there, and all my friends were there. Uh, they got there before I did. A lot of them knew about it before I did. And the pastor, Mike Toby, goes, hey, you need to stay at the mission home. Nobody's in it. You guys got the mission home for us. So we stayed there for two months. Chris Krause was a vice president here on campus. Chris goes, hey, we got a house at Ford Faculty. You can go live on campus for a while. God just brought all these things together for us. And, and you just kind of go, that's amazing. Fast forward, that's what our house looks like today. Took a year. One of our people in our Sunday school class was an architect, and she said, I'll draw the plans for your house. And you just, how many people get to redo their house, right? Because <laughs> we built it on the same place that we had it before. So, so I learned a lot of things through this. God is good all the time. Amen. All the time, God is good. Yep. Carolyn knows that from what, what happens with, the, with Richard. And we have to depend on God. I couldn't do it by myself. And I was this big, strong Air Force guy who was really used to doing a lot of things on my own, but I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. And I learned not to let pride get in the way. Because when people need to help you, you got to let them do it. And that's what I learned. Let people help you because they're blessed and you're blessed as well. So those are all things that I kind of learned the hard way. I wish I'd learned that one earlier, right? So... Air Force, I'm always talking about being the best, but I, it's ingrained in me in my Christian ethic. It's ingrained in me in the Air Force. We had this, integrity first, service before self, and excellence in all we do. That was what we lived by in the United States Air Force. And so I applied that to the classroom, to research, and to service. I wanted to make sure that I was doing the best because I wanted to glorify God through all that. And so I did. Character counts. If you don't think it does, look at the world today. Your character is important. We have the professional ethics in engineering, but that's like a minimum, right? Our Christian ethics far surpass what that is. And when I sit here and I look at this, I go, that's really good. And why do I do? What do you want to be known for? And it's working for the Lord and not for men. It's working for the Lord rather than for people. And I think every one of us ought to be thinking about that. So I got to read this article. And this article really grabbed me because our merely Christian college is enough. We talked about a lot of this when I first came to Baylor. And that's a, that's a mission statement from a private Baptist university, not Baylor. I'll let you read that. Just read that. Read that to yourself. There's some good words there. What's missing? What's missing? God. There's no mention of being a Christian university. So, so people read that and they're not offended because you haven't said God or you haven't said Christ or Christian. But is that what we want? The American culture is really putting a lot of pressure on Christian institutions. And we need to withstand that. And it's harder and harder to do it. Right? And so as a Christian university in the Baptist tradition, I think we still say that, and I know we do because I checked it on the website, we need to hold true to those ideals. So when I came to Baylor, this was our discussion. We were talking about what does it mean to be a Christian university in the Baptist tradition. We were thinking about what the future of Baylor ought to be concerning this topic. Uh, Don Schmeltikoff, Diana Vitanza, they were leading the charge on this. And we had some great conversations about what Baylor should look like. That's a book that was published by Ray Newberry in, in, in Mechanical Engineering. I actually wrote a chapter in there. So if you ever get the book, it is a good snapshot of where Baylor was uh, back then in 2003. And I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see that we still have Christian commitment in our mission statement. We don't ever want to lose that. And look at the kinds of things that I went online and saw. Largest Baptist university, largest Baptist educational. You can see a lot of things still, and there are more. I just didn't, didn't make the font small. But there's still a lot of things uh, that really tell us that we're a Christian university, and we have that prominent on our, on our website. But these are things that could divide us. And I'm not going to go through, and I just kind of wrote some things down there. Uh, there. There are more that could go up there. But these are the things that could divide us if we're not careful. We need to make sure that we hold fast to the biblical truth. And, and this is what we see in pro-ecclesia, right? 
Pursuit of knowledge strengthened by the conviction that truth has its ultimate source in God and by a Baptist heritage that champions religious liberty and freedom of conscience. That's what we need to hold to. That's in our website. That's in our pro-ecclesia. And for me, holding Christian principles and beliefs puts everything else in its place. And we need to remember that. And it brings me joy at Baylor with what I do. Now, I got one last thing. Relationships are our legacy. Relationships with God, with family, with colleagues, with students. That's our legacy that we leave behind. And that was brought home to me at Christmas. That's another reason I didn't do this earlier. This was so cool. The U.S. Air Force Oath of Enlistment. Justin Murphy, 2019 alumnus. He wanted to be a USAF pilot. Wanted in the worst way. We wrote letters. We prayed. And it took three years, but he was finally selected for the Air Force pilot training program. So exciting to hear that. He calls me up and he says, I need someone to administer my oath of enlistment. And I can't think of anybody else I'd rather have do it but you. Gosh, when you hear those, you just go, this is what it's all about. And so I got a flag from the ROTC uh, and I administered the oath of enlistment. I do affirm to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, the whole words that you might have heard before. But it means something when you're taking that and starting your career. It reminded me of where I was. It actually brought some tears to our eyes. The only people there were Renee, me, Justin, and his wife, Carolina. But what an important time it was. And Justin said, could you do that for me? It was really exciting to do that. So in conclusion, we all have a life story. Talk about it. Don't, don't let it hide under the bushel, as they say. Talk about it. Let people know. Share your faith and, and who you are. Our students want to know. Everybody wants to know that. Take time to reflect on who you are. Take time to reflect on where you've been and where you're going. We got life lessons. All of us do. Share those as well. And the thing is, have fun because there are great opportunities ahead. One more slide. <laughs> okay, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. There might be some questions. If anybody has any questions, please uh, uh, feel free to ask here. Otherwise, there's some snacks outside. Yeah. That's, right. so, yeah. that's an answer to a question. I, just, I have to go pick up a granddaughter. I just wanted to say, it's not really a question, it's just a comment. What a great speech that was, and, and what a great thing that you guys have done. Yeah. And it's just great to see the Christian character of Baylor and your Christian character here teaching. So Thank you, Alden. Thank you. So, good. Alden and me, us humanities people, were saying, we've seen a slide roll before. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's good. Okay. Yeah, Ken, I would just say, too, that uh, the talk has inspired me, you know, when I go back and interact with the hundreds of students that I have, you know, what you presented, the mindset may change a little bit, even though I try to help them and encourage them, but I think this is very encouraging to the faculty as well. So I appreciate it. Good. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>